for joining us for the talent session. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit of background uh, on the Center for Global Enterprise and the Digital Supply Chain Institute uh, that is sponsoring this. So uh, if we could move to the next slide. Uh, so just a few quick words on CGE, the Center for Global Enterprise. Uh, we are a, profit non, a private nonprofit research institution really focusing on trends and impacts uh, in an educational uh, kind of a manner uh, around uh, organizational issues, globalization issues. Got Digital Supply Chain Institute is one of the main centers of excellence, uh, obviously sponsoring today's uh, program. Uh, but there are some other aspects uh, that are very interesting uh, about the CGE as well. Uh, really the leader and the founder of CGE was Sam Palmasano, uh, who was the uh, former uh, CEO of IBM, uh, and there's a great panel of folks on the board of directors as well. Um, next slide, please. So the, uh, the the digital supply chain, what makes it interesting and unique, I think, is that it's a it's a practitioner research organization. So we're not doing academic research uh, divorced from the reality of what is going on in the in the world. Uh, so this group of members and uh, associates these member companies uh, that are part of the global supply chain community are really the focus. Uh, they work very closely with us in research. We work with them uh, in trying to surface what some of the practical solutions are for some of the, the challenges of things like uh, trans transitioning to digital. Next slide, please. But what is the digital supply chain uh, is really the question. Uh, so we want to, uh, Got a good uh, read on that. Um, the digital supply chain, the, the focus is on customer. Uh, it's on real-time utilization of data. Uh, it's, it's focused more on really understanding and stimulating demand. So the, the supply chain moving away from just fulfillment of, su of supply chain products and services to more of the front end of uh, really understanding consumer needs, customer needs and trying to sense and stimulate. Um, so that's, that's the way we're looking at the digital supply chain. We're, it's, it's a more expansive way of describing what's going on in the supply chain. Next slide, please. So a digital supply chain, uh, here's, a, here's a quote from Bill McDermott of uh, SAP. And I think it focuses in on, uh, again, what are we trying to understand about customers' needs and wants? Uh, so that uh, that customer centricity has now arrived uh, with supply chain. So that that's a, the, the customer focus is a big part of it. Next slide, please. And the the other part of it that's important is realizing the benefits of revenue growth and cost management, cost reduction. Uh, so it's it's reaching customers more effectively, but it's also finding ways to enhance uh, the way we deliver those products and services uh, in a more effective way, uh, increasing revenue and also managing costs more effectively. Next slide, please. So that's the background on it. Um, the way uh, the DSCI, the Digital Supply Chain Institute, has been approaching this research is in four main buckets. One is looking at how we stimulate demand. Uh, the second part is how we work with people, how we manage people, the people technology uh, aspect of it as well, how we manage the actual technologies involved, uh, and then how we manage risk. Uh, so today we're zooming in really on that managing people part of the equation. Uh, next slide, please. So in our research, uh, these are some early returns. I wanted to share with you guys uh, some of the uh, early uh, research uh, or recent research that we've been uh, performing in this area. Uh, so why why are we focused on the people side of it? Why does the people and talent side of the equation really come up so often? Well, when, in our surveys of some of our member organizations, uh, we ask them questions about how far are you ahead or behind in, in your transformation towards a digital supply chain? And the talent side, the people side, was where uh, it really came out an enormous percentage of uh, the folks that we have uh, surveyed and interviewed and spoken with over the last several years have uh, mentioned that the people and talent side was one of their number one concerns. Uh, let's take a look at that next slide. Uh, we've got just a little bit more drill down on uh, not, not only the people with the right skills being the, uh, the challenge 
but also how well they are able to collaborate uh, with each other across uh, the organization. We've uh, found out that that is a really uh, key way to unlock the performance potential uh, of this. So uh, with that in mind, let's take a look at this next slide. And I want to share a couple of ideas around the leadership and transformation. This is really uh, a, a chart that uh, I published in a, in a book chapter recently on leading the digital supply chain with the purpose of focusing in on the leadership actions that are required to get us to that digital supply chain. Uh, so if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, we're looking at the different focus areas. So what is the leadership focus that's required across uh, dimensions like uh, increasing demand, uh, the operational focus there, the, the people focus, the technology focus. And then we're contrasting the, the traditional supply chain with the digital supply chain. Uh, so if we talk about the traditional supply chain in demand, uh, it's really around meeting those, uh, those perfect order metrics. It's trying to manage inventories level, levels and balance uh, the, the constraints there. Uh, in a digital supply chain, we're moving more towards an integrated uh, vision where it's, uh, the, the supply chain is actually a source of competitive advantage. Uh, in the people side, individual functional performance measures around the plan, source, make, and deliver uh, divisions, the, the, the functional areas of the supply chain, and within that uh, business units. What we're seeing in the digital supply chain is that there's a much greater need for cross-functional uh, integration. Uh, and figuring out how the organization can move towards a uh, model uh, that rewards that kind of uh, more integrated uh, talent uh, behavior is really one of the keys to unlocking performance. Uh, so we ask uh, often, you know, what is the digital talent strategy and is it different? This is where uh, we, we really uh, want to get quickly to uh, what Liz uh, Faulkner at uh, Johnson & Johnson and what that organization has been doing uh, to try to promote uh, that kind of performance. Uh, and then finally, uh, technology, you know, so moving obviously away from more manual processes to ones that are more sophisticated in terms of uh, feedback, sensors, the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, the topics of which we have been covering in some of the other Expert Connect series. Um, let's move to the next slide. I want to ask uh, folks, too, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to just pepper those right in on that Q&A. Uh, and we'll try to answer those as we go along. Um, really what we're doing now is just kind of setting up the framework of what do we mean by digital supply chain and uh, what do we mean by the talent portion of that. Uh, but if you have questions and uh, you want to try to put the, the conversation in, in a different direction, please uh, go ahead and send those, those Q&A questions into that, that box. Uh, one of the other key areas I uh, wanted to share was uh, Something like a digital transformation doesn't take place overnight, uh, and certainly it doesn't take place. Uh, the transformation of your talent in your organization is something that, that requires a thoughtful development, a pathway for that. Uh, so one of the ways that we've uh, been talking about this is through uh, different horizons. So what can I do in horizon one, that, that operational, what do I do today uh, kind of uh, framework? Uh, but then how do I get to a growth mindset? What's that next horizon that takes me to a next uh, level? Uh, and then, then we can start talking about horizon three or a transformation. We don't go from what am I working on today to a transformation um, overnight. Um, so it's helpful, we think, to think of development of talent capabilities in terms of let's understand what do we have now? What is the strategic uh, situation we have uh, with our talent now? Do we have a talent strategy uh, that has been developed and socialized? Those are your first stepping stones towards uh, being able to develop a recruitment plan uh, and being able to develop the technical process and leadership training that's necessary uh, to become a more digital-oriented uh, supply chain. Uh, we found that being a more data-driven uh, organization, uh, even in cultural aspects, is a key uh, part of unlocking uh, the talent uh, in the digital supply chain. And then finally, we can start talking about uh, these more complex and exciting ideas like how do we, how do we really approach um, integration 
of talent across functional lines. That's where it gets uh, really exciting. Uh, but we think it's helpful to think in terms of what can I do now? Uh, what actions can I take in the operational frame uh, that will move me towards a, a transformational uh, experience later? Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna uh, jump, jump through this a little bit. Uh, I wanna just set up the idea uh, of, again, traditional versus digital. What is different? And what implications would that have on our talent strategy? Uh, so uh, in some of the publications that the, the Digital Supply Chain Institute has, uh, has put out, uh, we, we developed this idea of uh, data models. That's just a, a name for the process that you would uh, look at uh, for supply chain and how we get to a demand forecast. So this is a very simple diagram that just describes uh, what is a typical demand planning process uh, in the supply chain, traditional oriented. We're taking historical data, inventory levels. We're, taking, we're looking at the sales uh, incentives and we're combining that together to create uh, a forecast, a demand forecast. Uh, obviously, the more accurate that is, the better we can manage inventory levels and meet customer uh, demand. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. So what, what's different in a digital supply chain? So this is uh, an idea of what, a, what a, dig a more digital supply chain might look like. Now we're talking about gathering data from outside of the organization, uh, issues like uh, external factors, regulatory issues, the weather is a big one, very important, um, economy, um, the risk environment, bringing that together with sensor data uh, gathered around uh, social, from social media, from IoT, from smart sensors, from, from different uh, pieces of unstructured information. All that's being brought together into uh, this, this decision-making body uh, that is driven by data and algorithms uh, rather than human decision making to get to a more accurate uh, forecast for one thing, but also being able to deliver uh, better performance for customers um, at uh, the same or even less uh, cost. Uh, so better managed inventories, managing those cost levels, and also being able to deliver better uh, results for customers and customer satisfaction. Um, that's really the difference. But now, what does that mean for talent is the question for today. So let's go to our next slide and uh, talk about that a little bit. So with that data model in mind, so here's the data model, and then just advance that one more time, and then we'll get to uh, an integration. Liz, I might ask for your uh, insight on this as well. I believe this, uh, this, this idea is something that J&J that, uh, &J has been exploring as well. Uh, so. Uh, a little bit of an eye chart, but it gets the it gets the point across. When we start talking about digital supply chain talent, the key skills and capabilities that you need across the different levels of leadership, the different roles, uh, and the different uh, units uh, has really started to blend together more. Uh, so the point the point being, I'll summarize this uh, basically uh, to enable that digital model that we were just looking at you need a broader set of appreciation for what a data-driven organization uh, is all about. Uh, so uh, even a senior leadership person in the firm needs to have not just a strategic idea of what's going on uh, from a data perspective, but also uh, an, an appreciation of what the power of analytics could do for the company, um, how to better govern the, the data and leadership around sponsorship around data governance. Uh, that is so key to enable uh, other uh, roles in the organization to take advantage of the opportunity uh, that analytics provides. Um, likewise, as you're, as you're a data analyst, someone who is actually working with the data and creating uh, opportunities for making decisions for the company, uh, an appreciation and understanding of business models uh, and even corporate strategy is more important than it, it has been before. So this, uh, this notion of integration, when we talk about talent, uh, what that really means, the implications for that uh, in, in the digital supply chain 
uh, or a broader set of appreciation across um, the, the entire organization about how data can be governed, managed, and used strategically to try to deliver uh, better results in analytics. Um, Liz, I don't know, did you want to comment a little bit on this? Do you, do you agree with that perspective? Is that something that you're seeing uh, at J&J as well? Absolutely. Um, we are in the process of actually building some programs that we can um, build data citizens within the organization so that the, the average person in supply chain would really have an appreciation for the data. Um, I love that word, Dave. Appreciation is probably the most important. We're not building data scientists, right? We're going to acquire those as they come in. But we have to have that appreciation for data and what it's going to do to drive our strategic strategy. In fact, we have even um, are developing a new role, which we're calling a bridger role, between the functional leadership and the data scientists. So think of those as interpreters. It's people that can help both sides, the functional, get a better appreciation for uh, the data and the data side and the data scientists, a better appreciation for the business and where that business strategy is going. Wow, that's but great. Thanks, more. Liz. And I, I love what you were saying about data. It was a data citizens, right? Mm-hmm, absolutely. It, yeah, uh, and that, that's a, a really interesting term. I think it does kind of capture this idea that everyone needs to be responsible for data governance uh, and management. Uh, so the quality of the data is one of the keys to really unlocking the ability to use them effectively for analytics. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And, and to be honest, that's where we're struggling right now, right? Uh, most of our data scientists, unfortunately, are spending a lot of the time with trying to acquire the data and, and or cleaning the data as opposed to actually doing the algorithms. And so we're trying to make that switch as quickly as possible. But the emphasis really on making and building good data stewardship uh, is, is critical for us to be successful in this digital supply chain. Right, right. Beautiful. So, uh, guys, go ahead and toss in any Q&A that you've got for us. And uh, I have a question for the audience, actually, right now. If we do have a data scientist in the audience right now, we would love, if you don't mind identifying yourself, <laughs> we would love to, to uh, know that you're there so that we can recruit you, number one. Uh, no. <laughs> and then, uh, secondly, uh, just, uh, just try to get a, open up this conversation a little bit, because we, what we've heard from our our uh, membership organizations and the companies that we've been doing research with is that there's a lot of questions around who are these data scientists and why are they different and you know how do I get one or <laughs> where do they where do they where are they now uh, so let's take a look at the next slide uh, and we're going to drill down on this idea of data scientists uh, so uh, they they are so often uh, mentioned these days so uh, this this definition here and any definition of a, of, uh, of a complex role like this is debatable. So this is, I'm not trying to put forth a standardized definition here, uh, but I was, I was very fortunate and I had a chance to work with some very legitimate data scientists uh, in, in a number of roles. And I, I was able to work on a leadership program with some of the key data science uh, educators uh, at NYU's uh, uh, data uh, uh, science uh, institute there. Uh, and uh, one of the conversations that we kept going back to is, uh, how do we define this? You know, how, what, is, what do we mean by data scientists? And so according to experts uh, in data science, uh, and I'm talking about academic experts, folks that are uh, really leading the field and trying to develop new ways of uh, using data and analytics to predict things more accurately, uh, that these are very highly trained individuals. You know, so the term data scientist is thrown around a lot uh, now, but we, we really are talking about a very uh, highly educated individual uh, with a lot of experience in building uh, models, data models uh, that, that have explanatory power as well as predictive power. Uh, so the data modeling uh, capability uh, can't emphasize that enough. If you're, if you're interviewing someone for a data scientist role, uh, ask them about their data modeling, uh, because uh, the, if, if, they, if they can't answer that question, you might want to know uh, a little bit more about their background. Uh, it's, it's super important to get the model right. 
and the data quality, of course, uh, is a is a huge issue. And, and like Liz was saying, it's uh, we want we want these valuable resources to be focused more on uh, creating insights and, and better predictions and creating better models and and not struggling so much just to align uh, the data sets. Um, data scientists they work with very comfortably with both structured information that is coming out of your transaction systems, but they're also able to envision what unstructured data might be combined with structured data to come up with new insights, uh, but insights that have uh, integrity uh, and are able to help advance our understanding of uh, the uh, complexity of a, of a different problem. Um, at, at least as of uh, recently, these are difficult people to find uh, and re recruit and retain. One of the big challenges being, even if you can uh, attract a data scientist into your organization, uh, if they're not treated in a way that gives them the, the ability to really work uh, effectively. So let's say that you brought them in and they were put into a technical department or division, uh, and instead of uh, a business problem solving, uh, kind of a role. Uh, it, it may be difficult to retain that talent, uh, and they're often uh, being uh, pulled away. The best uh, folks in this area uh, are being pulled away uh, by some of the, of the top digital native organizations. So it, it creates a real challenge for traditional companies to understand uh, how to create a brand, a, an employment brand, uh, that is attractive to this group, uh, and also to uh, really give uh, the the right tools, information, uh, and access uh, to data scientists to really uh, enable uh, them to to move uh, forward on some of the complex issues. So, uh, Liz, does that uh, description resonate for you guys? You mentioned data scientists. Is that something that you guys are struggling with as well as to uh, att attract and retain that particular type of talent? Absolutely, and and I think. Uh Historically, we went the route that you described of putting them in a technical area, and it fails miserably. Um, it, it's it's not um, it, the, the, you have one word on your slide that's that's so critical, and it's you know they they need to feel valued for their unique capabilities, and those capabilities are very different than traditional supply chain, let's say process engineers, reliability engineers. Right there, it's a very different skill set. It's a very different value that they bring to the organization. And we've uh, very recently kind of switched that model around a little bit and have more of a center-led type of uh, data organization, more in a hub and smoke, spoke type of model where the hub is where we're keeping our, our pure data scientists um, and the relationship back to our businesses and our segments within um, the, the three kind of uh, sectors that we have within J and J is where those um, those folks come in, and the importance of and the criticality of making sure that they are they, they stay connected, but the that we actually uh, switch the value of that data scientist and that they're together in a unique setting with other data scientists is very critical. Oh, I love that. Uh, yeah, so you're you're sharing those resources across the organization uh, and and keeping them in that, the environment where they're being stimulated, where they're given um, access to the right kinds of challenging business problems. Um, that's, that's great. That's the goal. Dave, uh, if I could interrupt it, yeah. actually, as a follow up. A little bit. Of course. Uh, you know, I'm curious because um, you know I'm listening to you, and I know that a lot of companies are absolutely struggling to find data scientists because, as you said, they are rare. Uh, they're also very expensive. So what, what strategy or what advice do you have for companies that know they need one, but A, can't afford or can't, you know, recruit them? So how do they create a data, you know, a strategy that would be able to take advantage of this data if they can't get the data scientists? Well, that's that's a tough one. Um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure, to be perfectly honest. I do know that there are organizations out there where you can, you know, hire folks to do, you know, on a, a more of a um, ad hoc part time type of basis, right? Which is, you know, certainly a strategy that you can use if you can't um, particularly, you know, hire in. They are expensive. Um, the value that they bring. If I think the the challenge is you have to get past that initial 
um, expense, let's say, because the value that they actually bring back is, is you know, a hundredfold multiplied by, by what that is. But it's that initial and it takes time. And that's, you know, you, you need to invest 18, 24 months in a data scientist type of group before you actually re get that return on that investment. So I think if you don't have that time and or you know initial outlay, you know certainly there are organizations where you can you know buy ad hoc type of services. But that the the, the uh, let's say challenge there is understanding the business, right? So if we go back to Dave's couple slides previously when he talks about that. Um, that appreciation for the business side that has to come from the data science. You know, there we spend um, a fair amount of time just educating on, you know, our products and what we do within J and J. That's important for the data scientists to know. And so, when you don't have them as part of your, you know, uh, staff, it makes it a little bit difficult. And you have to then prepare for that and have some very structured programs so they understand your business if you're doing that kind of on an ad hoc model. Great, thank you. Yeah, really great, great, really great answer. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, this, uh, this challenge uh, is one that we'll continue to, to be working on. I think it's a leadership issue, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, to, to be able to, to establish the strategic need to, to create that center, to uh, enable that center to develop over a longer period of time, like you said, 18 months or so, you, you need a, a powerful vision and leadership uh, action to really make that possible, don't you? Absolutely. You need, you, leadership is the strongest uh, lever that we have to actually <laughs> making that shift to the digital exactly. supply chain, right? If we don't have that yeah. strong leadership, that strong vision, um, understanding that you know, we may be giving up some short-term gains for the longer, the longer play. That's a, a really tough, uh, especially when you're in a, in a tough competitive business, uh, like our consumer, you know, arm. That is, it's tough to understand the investment and the time that's needed. But once you have leaders that rally around that and they start to see the value that comes in, it, it goes a whole lot smoother. That's great. Liz, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to quote you on this. I won't uh, take it uh, and just use it, but leadership is the strongest lever we have to enable the digital supply chain. I think that's, that's, that's great stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide. I, I want to uh, make sure we leave uh, plenty of time for Liz to talk through some of the things that are going on in the Supply Chain Academy. So I'm going to kind of uh, bounce across this. Uh, this stuff has been published before, so if you're, if you're interested in the details, of what uh, digital supply chain integrator behavior is, uh, we can point you to some resources that uh, that go deeper into this. But in addition to just digital talent, uh, there is a challenge in the digital supply chain uh, that is even more uh, of a challenge than it has been traditionally, uh, and that is to find ways to promote cross-functional boundary uh, behavior. Uh, you know, so uh, this working in silos it never was really a great way to, to do it, but now it's even more difficult uh, to develop a, a value chain uh, using data as its backbone unless we find ways to promote uh, this uh, act actively looking for ways to cross boundaries to uh, problem solve in teams. Uh, so <laughs> it's hard to develop high performance teams, even harder to develop high performance teams that are problem solving across boundaries. You know, so it sounds like it's almost impossible. Like, well, okay, how do you do that? Of course, it's a great idea. Let's have a high performance organization of, of individuals that are sacrificing their own individual goals for those of the organization, that network performance idea. Um, but how? How is the question? And so some of the work uh, that Liz and I have done in the past has been focused on trying to promote these kinds of behaviors, trying to create a platform and a process uh, for uh, individuals and organizations to see the benefits of collaboration uh, across boundaries in particular uh, in, in solving supply chain problems. Uh, it's even more important um, as we become more dependent upon the sharing of information uh, the secure 
sharing of information across functions where trust across those boundaries uh, needs to really be uh, developed. Um, so let's continue on though. That uh, That's a rich uh, idea, uh, one that uh, probably warrants a whole program in and of itself, but uh, but we just want to put, put that out there that integration uh, as well uh, as uh, as digital talent, you know, technical talent um, are key pieces. So let's uh, let's advance uh, to the next slide. Okay, so I want to transition over uh, to uh, to Liz here to chat about uh, the the Supply Chain Academy at J and J. Um, I just want the audience to think about as as Liz is is chatting, think about basically three levers in digital supply chain talent. Uh, we want to talk about acquisition, development, and integration. Uh, so some of the, the, the types of questions that we are asking our members, that we're asking folks in our uh, executive leadership forums, uh, basically wherever we have a chance to work with companies uh, and talk about digital supply chain, we're asking them three main uh, focus areas uh, around uh, talent. Uh, one is, uh, you know, how uh, are you acquiring your digital talent? Where are you finding it? How are you attracting it? Uh, how does your employment brand, that is how you're perceived in talent markets, uh, how does that help or hinder uh, your ability to recruit? You know, so this is one set of frameworks I want you to think about. Um, let's look at the next one. Uh, so that'll be about development. Uh, so then we also ask our, our member companies and our research uh, sites uh, to talk about, um, you know, what what actual training and development do you have in place, you know, for leadership training, uh, for improving collaboration, for team, team uh, collaboration, uh, to become more data driven. Uh, and, you know, the skills that are needed, you need a, a digital talent strategy and, and develop training for those skills. So that's another uh, key component to it. And then let's take a look at the last one. Uh, and this goes back to the integration uh, behaviors we were talking about. So, hey, acquiring talent, sure, we've got it. Developing it, yes, we're sending them to training programs. But then there's that final piece that I think is often ignored. It's not just build and buy. It's also integrating. Uh, it's addressing this challenge of how to create the conditions in the organization where purposeful collaboration can actually take place across uh, levels. Uh, and I'm not going to take Liz's punchline away, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Liz, now and just say, uh, those are the questions that we're asking. And then, uh, you know, maybe uh, if you could share a little bit about what you've done in your role in the, in the Supply Chain Academy at Johnson & Johnson, how, how you've been grappling with uh, the development piece and uh, maybe some of this piece on, on uh, integration really uh, would be great. Absolutely. So, Happy to. Take it away. Okay. So um, as Dave indicated, I head up a, a group in J&J &J called the Supply Chain Academy. The Academy itself uh, is really only a couple of years old. Um, actually, I think it's three years this month. So it was, um, it's a relatively new organization. And even within the last three years, we have shifted focus on a couple of different things as our business needs have, have changed in focus. But if you go to the next slide, I'll give you a brief overview of, um, you know, kind of our mission um, and vision with AIR, right? Um, Kathy Wangle, the head of our supply chain within Johnson & Johnson, um, had put out for us that, you know, she wants to be the world's best supply chain. And looking at that as we're going forward, um, this, the Academy has no different vision from that, but, but our mission is slightly different in that we want to make sure that we're accelerating the development of our supply chain leaders. And we have to identify what are the learning needs and the gaps. And as I indicated, you know, within three years, those learning needs and gaps have drastically shifted as we're moving into uh, the digital supply chain world. But we also want to do that in, you know, innovative learning centric type of modalities. I have to say when I came in to the group to start it up, um, death by PowerPoint was probably the way we did most of the learning and training. And obviously, that's not the way of the future. Um, and then figuring out how do we do that in that continuous time frame, like those continuous improvement modalities. If you go to the next slide, give you just briefly a look at 
what the organization looks like. And so we uh, focus um, significant uh, resources in our continuous improvement uh, type of learning. And by that, I mean uh, Six Sigma, Lean, Dex, all of the foundational types of learning and programs that we're doing. Now, we have shifted a lot of those from classroom-based you know, learning and education to more just-in-time needs as we roll out our Johnson Johnson operating system. And when we think about, and Dave mentioned, integrating, that's how we're integrating these new uh, modalities of not only learning, but do, new ways of working. Um, you know, Lean has been around forever, guys, so I'm not saying that we've, you know, inventing new ways there, but is how we're changing the culture within J&J &J to make it chip. And that cultural change actually starts with leadership. And if we think about how we need to develop leaders of the future is really where, you know, if we look on the top left side of that is we have our development. We have development of um, our high level leaders in terms of those that are in nominated programs, but we also have leadership programs for all. And what I mean by that is we've called the best of the best of J&J's leadership programs and pulled out what we need to make sure that we're advancing leadership within the organization. We're very good at technical training and we, we spend a fair amount of time educating in that technical realm. What we don't spend enough time on is understanding how to take our technical folks and make them good leaders of the future. So we invest a fair amount of time, energy, and money into uh, that leadership part of that development. But we also have a learning arm and that learning arm is what we think of as the new as we're coming in and particularly as one of our strategic initiatives in terms of manufacturing for the future. What does our supply chain associates need in the future to become and to stay um, on top of the changes that are occurring within the industry at large? Um, someone, and I don't remember the quote, but someone told me that um, freshmen entering college this year by the time they graduate, what they have learned this year will become obsolete. So if we think about that and how we need to continue to educate our uh, supply chain associates so that they stay up to speed is really where our learning color comes in. And then how hey, do we... Hey, hey. Sure, Dave. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I wanted to just jump in there and ask, uh, so uh, this idea of taking a technical person and then putting them into a leadership experience. Uh, two parts to it. One is, uh, so how does that go? <laughs> like, how do they react? Uh, are they, yeah, sign me up for leadership or, you know, what are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, so realistically, how does that go? Uh, and then, uh, you know, is it effective? Like, does it, can you, can you build that leadership capability in uh, someone who has kind of grown up on the technical side of the house and has been maybe promoted based on their technical expertise and maybe not so much on their ability to build teams. Uh, absolutely. So I'm going to talk about it in two parts. Um, the first part are folks that are, are on a leadership track to begin with. Um, so let's talk about those individuals. So these are um, usually folks that are nominated into our leadership development programs. Um, I have to say, when they first come into some of those programs, um, they think they've got it because, as you indicated, they have been promoted through their careers on what they've delivered. And now we're showing them uh, not only different skills, um, but different ways to interact. So what we what has occurred in the past with our leadership development is really that they actually have a program that they have to, or a project that they have to deliver. So our programs uh, for leadership in those nominated programs run about six to nine months, depending on the program that you're in, and you have to deliver a project after that. And you're then partnered and working with uh, groups of also very um, highly and energized, highly motivated individuals, and now you have to figure that out. And so we kind of throw them into that, um, and they stumble. They, they stumble in the beginning. We give them a lot of coaching and guidance and webinars um, on all of the skills that are necessary. And lo and behold, by the end, they get it. And then they, they can not only deliver a very effective uh, uh, 
project uh, that has a real business need, but they've also learned those skills. Um, but we don't want to stop there because that is really, um, let's just say, you know, a drop in the bucket when you think about that, right? We may, for our, some of our programs uh, at that manager level, we may put 100 to 150 people a year through that program, right? When we think of J and J, it's a sixty-five thousand yeah. uh, person <laughs> supply chain, right? It's a drop yeah, in the bucket. Like, yeah. How do we get yeah. the, the rest? And so we've come up with other programs that uh, actually we're just releasing that really hit the rest of of management there and with those skills they need, and then ask them to come back for their capstone part of that program uh, that they do mostly virtually. A couple of programs that. Uh, that we do with them that are either classroom style or a combination of classroom and virtual, um, that they then come back in and have to present to our engineering council uh, what they've learned through a project as their capstone to be certified uh, as a JNJ leader. Really interesting. And I'll just We're just call starting that. I can't give you, yeah, I can't give you, uh, yeah. uh, you know, how we're doing, but uh, no, at no, least no, that's uh, okay. take the forex. I thought I would just tease you about that. The, uh, <laughs> so the thing I'll just call out, and then I, I, I'll give it back to you, of course, is uh, the experiential aspect of it. So uh, we've had some uh, seen great results across different organizations by by doing exactly what you're saying. Is this uh, let's let's not just put them in a classroom, but let's give them projects uh, where they can can experience the benefits of integration and problem solving in teams, uh, and then that that leadership experience that will stick. Uh, if they get a chance to uh, actually do it. Uh, but back to you, Liz, we want to see some more of this cool stuff you're yep, sharing. Absolutely. <laughs> so just, uh, just to round this slide out briefly, you know, it all comes with how do you retain that knowledge and how do you connect it <clears throat> to people? Um, I laugh that there are, um, and some of, some of the work that we do with a, a supplier that helps us uh, kind of connect the dots, right? How do you determine there are people out there that are just natural dot connectors, and they help uh, with that knowledge transfer, right? So we spend a fair amount of time, you know, not only on the, the IT part of knowledge, but also making sure that we're connecting and getting those, what I call in term, chief dot connectors out there so that we can continue that knowledge building. Um, I wish I could say that we have a tremendous culture of learning within J&J, &J and it's not totally there, right? We do a lot of great work, we do a lot of great learning, but it's not just a culture of learning. Obviously, we have to deliver products, right? And so there's a, a, a huge focus on our deliver aspect, but it's how we make sure that we can transfer that knowledge from uh, organization to organization and person to person. We spend a fair amount of time within the academy making sure we can make those connections. Hey Liz, got a quick quick question from uh, Gregory uh, out there. But thank you, Gregory, by the way, for that question. Uh, so uh, it's super interesting. Basically, he's saying, um, I, "Well, I'll just I'll pose it this way. I'll say, uh, are you guys using data driven, data informed tools to help identify uh, how to improve team performance?" Ah, it's that's a great a, that's question. A cool question. I, yeah, that's yeah, really cool. It, yeah. It's a it's a great question. I wish um, I could say yes, we are, but we haven't to date. I'll give you a little. Uh, if you actually go to the next slide, and I'm, I can probably talk through some of that, right? I'll give you a little bit of of an area of where we're moving towards um, a, as we go down this digital journey. We've only been on it for about two years, maybe a little bit more than that, um, as we're going through. And one of the areas that we have, we're working towards is understanding um, what type of capabilities we have in the organization and not making that uh, too onerous of, a, of an effort. So we're trying to do some modeling um, around what we have and making some data models and assumptions based on smaller subsets to actually indicate what we would have in the organization at large. So that's about the extent of it right now, um, but it, you know, it, it's, a great, it's a great question and a great pose and a, and a challenge back to the organization to understand what, their, um, what type of um, talent they have in the organization and how to, uh, how to utilize that in a, with some data-driven modes. Thank you. If we look at um, Dave, I don't know if you have any other thoughts there yourself on. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that HR in general, like if we just, I, I mean, I, I think of talent development leadership as uh, almost a separate thing from HR, but, but I, I work with HR parts of organizations and they're all becoming more data driven. Uh, and they, you know, they need their own data strategies. And, you know, when I speak with groups of uh, HR leaders and, and we talk about this topic, the question that goes back to, well, where do I find that talent? How do I, you know, where do I get a data scientist? <laughs> you know, can I have one of those? Uh, and, uh, you know, so my, my quick advice would be uh, borrow one, right? So maybe HR talent leadership uh, might not be, we might not be able to get our own uh, data science uh, or data analyst to help us uh, create uh, new ways of uh, assessing talent. Uh, but maybe we can craft uh, a uh, solution that, that borrows some of that talent uh, with a really well-defined business problem and challenge uh, and then uh, move it that way. And it's exactly what I've done. We beg, borrow, and steal across the organization <laughs> however, exactly. however we can to, uh, to get our done. hands on that data. <laughs> but if we think about how we're going forward with some of these new technologies and, and we know they're going to be significantly changing the way J&J operates, um, you know, what does that really look like? And the emergence of that, um, both the new digital and, you know, non-digital technologies as we, they're going to fundamentally change the way we do, we operate, the way we work. But it, that has a huge um, effect on all of our associates, right? And in varying degrees, right? Starting at the shop floor. And when we think about that and the changes to the roles um, and how we need to bridge those roles, as I indicated you know, earlier, we're developing new roles in that technical space that we're actually calling bridgers, right? People that can actually cool. help that IT, OT integration, right? That's really what we're thinking. And then when we look at um, you know, material science, right? 3D printing is, is very large for us, um, and it's going to change the way our business segments work, not just today, but when, when, we, when I talk about our um, initiatives of manufacturing for the future, you know, way out into the future, right? So how do we keep ahead of that curve in terms of educating our, our own staff, of hiring in staff, as, as Dave, as you indicated, and or um, uh, not only just the integration, but the integration of third parties, and how do we make that integration, right? So so um, when we think about, we're not going to do it all ourselves. We are partnering very closely with a lot of our supply base. And how do we integrate that into um, our organization to make that a seamless look? They're all the yeah, challenges a, that, uh, that we have ahead of us. Yeah, it's a, re it's a value chain now, right? And, and uh, the trust and the ability to share information securely, but then productively across those boundaries. It's not just boundaries across the organization. It's actually ex external to the organization, too. Um, I just want to call attention to for the audience just to, you know, zero in on this bridger role idea that Liz mentioned, because that's super interesting. And uh, a lot of the experts that we've spoken to in our research uh, data gathering have talked about the importance of how you really need to marry together the technical expertise, you know, the data science analytics big data kind of uh, expertise with someone that has domain expertise from the field. So supply chain, operational performance, uh, and it's, it's combining those two kinds of talents together. Finding one person that has all of that. Have you ever found anybody like that, Liz? I, no. <laughs> it's not likely. It's not likely. So yeah, find ways to combine uh, folks together. Um, let me uh, add one more question that came in from uh, the hey, audience. Dave, so, uh, can, I just, uh, yeah. can I just insert one? If you, I'm, I'm just oh, curious. of course. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I just want to follow up on the Bridger, uh, which is a very interesting position. Do you at J and J uh, see that as a uh, as a position where you'll um, educate or grow a a constituency of data savvy managers throughout the organization? Do you see that role as an evolution into senior management where you have a much more data savvy uh, management and leadership group coming up? Uh, both, right? We, we actually see it, um, you know, from, from the, our, our plants all the way through. So they would be those hub and spokes. 
but um, for the larger part of J&J, &J, we're looking very strongly at building uh, curriculums for our highest leaders in there around data to give them an appreciation um, on both the supply chain as well as the commercial side of the business to really give them an appreciation for data and the value and the importance that data um, in our new digital world is going to be for the organization at large. All right, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, you know what, uh, Liz, I think you have at least one or two more slides, so why don't we um, have you cover those, and then we do have one, uh, at least one more question we'll try to get to before we wrap up. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, the, the importance, and I, I've kind of alluded to this before, right, that the skill sets that are going to be needed are going to go throughout the organization, and it definitely has a cascading effect. Right? When we think about our engineers, our scientific folks, or our quality uh, uh, people, we have to make sure that they're infused with these new skills. Data science um, is going to be an acquisition, and we're on that acquisition journey for, for data scientists. And as we build those organizations, making sure that we actually cascade the right information all the way down to our maintenance and technical folks within the plant. And, uh, you know, I'll honestly say that, you know, we kind of forgot about our operators when we were when we started this journey and uh, have have really quickly uh, backpedaled to make sure that we included our operators in uh, this journey, this educational journey for sure, so that they can feel confident and comfortable in the new roles that they will be um, exposed to and experience in the future. And then if you go to the next slide, I'll just briefly talk about um, some of the uh, implementation efforts that we're doing for manufacturing for the future. Um, we started with just two technologies that we are looking for and did it at a very strong deep dive into the critical skill sets that were needed and they were you know, advanced uh, process controls and integrated quality. And so when we look at those two developing technologies and how the digital supply chain is going, we knew that um, our engineering base both our manufacturing operators as well as data scientists were going to be affected. And when we think about that, the skill sets that were, are needed as, are those that are listed there, right? Operator actually falls in a role, not necessarily a skill set, but when we think about our process engineering, reliability engineering, all of the work that we do in sensors, those skill sets along with electromechanical are, need to be strengthened, right? We need to depend on um, center-led COEs that we have to help with that. Uh, we're partnering very closely with our suppliers and tech centers. We're starting to move into the area of uh, partnerships with academia and making sure that we develop very, very strong partnerships there two ways, right? Um, not only for the research that comes out of academia, but also clearly for, and you know, a love of mine that I haven't started for yet, but trying to influence what curriculums of the future look like. Right. So if we can't right. help uh, it, it, you know, really change what curriculums are, we're going to have those same engineers coming out five years from now that we have now. And they have to have a different you know, background and makeup. So partnering with uh, our academia is will be important for us. And then we are building customized curriculum that will be unique for J&J &J around these types of skill sets. And then obviously still uh, you know, working on acquiring talent. Um, as I mentioned, we will partner with um, some, some of our suppliers and tech centers, particularly for our operators, and make sure that we have targeted training programs for them um, so that they feel comfortable in the new roles, whether that be new equipment that they're having um, and or kind of new ways of working that gets out of uh, siloed uh, environments will be unique to, to those. And then data science, that hub and spoke model, as I talked about, we're working very closely building strategic partnerships with um, suppliers there also. Yeah, I'll, I'll all just all add that. Uh, yeah, I'll just add that. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. Uh, really interesting stuff. I, I loved uh, seeing how you guys are thinking about this. I just wanted to plug uh, from the uh, talent supplier side of the equation. So uh, as uh, someone in an academic institution, uh, training managers of the future, uh, you know, I, I, I do see shifts in in the curriculum and a lot of it comes from great advice and being connected to 
uh, organizations, uh, you know, and their needs, you know. So I think that's that's something that I, I think academic institutions need to get better at doing is listening uh, and trying to supply talent uh, that that meet the needs. And uh, just two quick things: one, obviously technical. So we're seeing more and more uh, need for actual training in some of the tools, uh, and especially mathematics. Uh, some of the basics, like so, rather than just teach a tool, it's teach some of the fundamental statistical and uh, analytic methods, uh, the mathematical methods, so that they don't go out of date quickly. That's one interesting strategy I've seen, you know, focus on, on that. Uh, the other is leadership, right? So I'm, I'm in management uh, org behavior, uh, and so we've created uh, new programs uh, that have, uh, are really targeted towards maybe engineering students that need, you know, to understand how to work effectively in a team. What, what are the leadership capabilities you need to be successful uh, in organization? So uh, we're seeing kind of that blend going, going on on the supply side of the equation uh, as well. Um, so we're just about out of time. Um, uh, we do have one qu quick uh, last question from uh, Raji. Uh, maybe we can just uh, sort of hit it in a kind of a 30 second mode, you know, so um, new hire programs. Uh, you know, are, are they changing, uh, at all? Uh, yeah, it sounds like maybe they are. Is that, is that, uh, true? Yeah, in I, your think, case? I think, I yeah. think we will, yeah. we're going to be targeting, uh, we've always targeted certain universities as we hire after, hire from, but, um, we will be changing how that looks in the future in terms of making sure that they're even more targeted and, or, um, at least are coming with, the right curriculums that we're looking for going forward. Very good. Well, listen, I'll close out for us. Uh, uh, Liz, thank you so much, uh, my friend and colleague from uh, J&J, that you have made this uh, conversation a uh, hundred times more interesting than it would have been if we were just uh, repeating some research that we had done. So it really brought us to life. Absolutely uh, thrilled uh, with the conversation. Um, for upcoming Expert Connect series, uh, we do have one final uh, Expert Connect series in this run. We'll probably probably be doing these again. Uh, but uh, if you can make risk and competitive advantage, we'll have uh, my colleague uh, Craig Moss, absolute super expert in this area. He'll be uh, talking about risk and competitive advantage. I think I'll be on that as well. Uh, probably asking some really difficult questions <laughs> because it's, it's a very tough uh, area. Ira, did you have anything to close out? Thank you guys so much for joining today. It's been a pleasure to uh, speak to you again. And I'll uh, back to you, Ira. Yeah, no, thank you, Dave. That's been, you did a wonderful job. And Liz, thank you uh, for taking the time to join us. I, and I agree, this was a wonderful session. And as I mentioned, uh, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel and you can catch uh, this one and some of the previous ones. And again, thank you all for your time and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.